our final speaker of the day, and uh, following uh, our final speaker, we'll have a Q&A, of course, and then a closing musical performance. Um, our final speaker, I could list her accomplishments endlessly as well. Uh, Mae Birnbaum is the head of the Department of Entomology here. Um, she is one of the world's leading experts on the mysterious colony collapse disorder, which is killing millions and millions of bees, which I've asked her to speak about. And, uh, and then my favorite fact about her is, is that there was, in fact, a character on the X-Files named after her, Bambi Berenbaum, a, <laughs> yes, a, you know, beautiful and incredibly intelligent uh, uh, entomologist on what was perhaps the best episode of the X-Files ever. Um, so with that introduction, Professor May Berenbaum. Thank you. The episode was called War of the Coprophages, about a mysterious plague of cockroach-related deaths investigated by Agent Mulder. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the stalwarts who stayed. Um, and I have to say, doc, I didn't get the note that Dr. Hillman got about uh, personalizing things, so this is just all about the bees. We go from crash to collapse. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, the mysterious disappearances of the bees and uh, why it's important to, to care about the bees. So I think the first thing to do is to, to establish just exactly which bees uh, everyone's worried about. It's, uh, there have actually been a number of declines in, um, um, among bees, uh, not only in North America, but throughout the world. But the one that has been making headlines is this particular species, Apis mellifera, the western honeybee. Um, the name literally, Latin name literally means the bees that carry, the bee that carries honey. Uh, not exactly technically correct. The uh, bee actually carries nectar and then actually makes the honey. But this is, uh, um, this species is uh, semi-domesticated around the world and is a uh, principal source of sweetness for eons. Uh, there are biblical references to honey, and uh, that's really uh, what most people associate with uh, the honeybee. Honey in the U.S. is about a $150 million business, but the major economic contribution of this particular species uh, really has very little to do with honey. In fact, it's, uh, the value of honey is dwarfed by the value of this particular species uh, as a deliverer or provider of pollination services. Uh, just a little bit of birds and bees, which uh, uh, should be a refresher. Pollination is the process by which pollen grains, which are actually male sex cells, contain male sex cells, uh, are transferred to this receptive female surface, the stigma, to bring about fertilization, fusion of the male and female sex cells, or gametes, uh, which is a necessary step in producing seeds. So basically, pollination is uh, plant sex. Uh, uh, the, the concept of birds and bees is often used to, as a child-friendly way to explain sex, but in fact, probably more, more people know about human sex than they do about this business. So. Uh, now, most of the uh, planets, flowering plants, about 200,000 of the 250,000 or so species, need help from animals to reproduce, and uh, in order to bring about that uh, uh, movement of pollen from uh, uh, the place where it's produced to the receptive female surface. Plants can't move around, they're firmly rooted to the ground, so they depend on animal partners. And the western honeybee is the world's premier managed pollinator. It has a number of behavioral attributes that make it particularly well suited for this task. Among other things, it's a truly social species, or eusocial species, the term goes, which means uh, it, has, it lives in large colonies, very large colonies, among the largest among the bees. So uh, the one hive or colony of Apis mellifera can have 30 to 50,000 workers. Um, that is a really nice attribute, particularly for uh, American monoculture agriculture, where uh, we have uh, farms of, uh, in one particular uh, type of, of crop plant that, that extend for hundreds or thousands of acres. You need a lot of agricultural workers out in the field. And a honeybee hive can provide those. They have uh, a remarkably sophisticated means of communicating with each other and actually providing directions uh, to fellow foragers uh, as to where nectar sources are. So um, they can see um, polarized light. They, they can actually give provide directions by a symbolic um, uh, represent, well, most people know the details of the, of the bee dance language, which uh, is angled in the high from vertical, the same uh, distance uh, angle from uh, where the sun is, so that it's essentially bee GPS. So uh, a returning forager 
who's found a good uh, floral source can direct fellow workers to that particular source. And the thing about pollination is you need re repeat visits. A pollen grain from one species does no good if it's going to another different species of plant. So this um, BGPS communication system uh, ensures uh, uh, flower fidelity. Uh, unlike many species of bees, the honeybee has an extraordinarily broad diet. It's among the most, however you assess these things, intelligent uh, or behaviorally flexible of uh, insect species, and it can actually learn how to manipulate all kinds of floral structures. So it uh, can feed or collect nectar and pollen from a tremendous diversity of, of types of plants. And finally, naturally, in, in nature, they like to nest in cavities. They like um, tree holes, like where the, the middle of a tree rots out. That's where they build their, their colonies. So they took quite readily to our um, practice of building boxes. And they, uh, so they'll live in a box which you can pick up and move. So all of these attributes make them extraordinary pollination partners for uh, human agriculture. And their contribution uh, really does uh, have a profound influence on, on our daily lives um, because of honeybee pollination. We, about a third of what we eat is the direct or indirect result of honeybee pollination. An example here, for better or worse, um, without honeybees, a uh, Big Mac from McDonald's would have uh, no all-beef patties. That's because uh, ca uh, uh, beef cattle are reared primarily on... on uh, um, alfalfa and clover hay, both of which require bee pollination. Uh, no lettuce, bee pollinated. No onions, no pickles, no cheese. Uh, there'd be sesame, no sesame seeds, but there would be a bun because wheat is not a, uh, is a wind pollinated, not an animal pollinated plant. And I don't know what's in special sauce. So. <laughs> now, um, because of these. Uh, biological attributes, and because of this tremendous need for pollination services, at least occasionally, at least in part by uh, reductions in uh, the abundance and uh, um, activity of native pollinators, there, there's a tremendous demand for the pollination services of honeybees. And pollination services are delivered by bees, which in turn are delivered by beekeepers, who uh, pile two, three, four hundred uh, hives on the back of a flatbed and deliver these uh, well, over winter in Florida, and deliver these bees to provide pollination services wherever crops and whenever crops need them. Blueberries up in um, uh, New England, uh, clover in uh, Montana, almonds in California. Over 90 crops in North America are dependent upon pollination services delivered by the honeybee. Well, um, th this... Uh, is not a fact that was widely appreciated or widely known until uh, something of a disaster befell the beekeeping industry. It was in uh, the fall of 2006. Dave Hackenberg, who's a, one of the really big migratory beekeepers, that's what the one they call the ones who transport thousands of colonies across the country, and his overwintering colonies uh, essentially, um, almost overnight, um, basically disappeared. It was very dis in a disturbing way without any precedent. Basically, the, bee, the, the oldest, most experienced bees in the colony, the foragers, the ones who goes, go out to collect nectar and pollen, simply disappeared, leaving behind the queen, uh, a number of grubs, and the nurse bees, the young bees that take care of the, of the babies in the nest. Um, and that's simply not a viable combination of, uh, of uh, individuals to maintain a colony. Um, this disease, uh, initially called uh, fall dwindle, ultimately became colony, called colony collapse disorder, CCD, because with this altered structure, colonies simply couldn't maintain themselves. He lost over 400 colonies essentially overnight. Uh, what was also disturbing is that, uh, no, well, a, a beehive that's abandoned is an, an overwhelming temptation for all kinds of opportunistic uh, creatures. It's full of calories, full of protein, and uh, it's frequently raided. Bees have all kinds of pests that come into the hive. And the scavengers seemed very slow to move into these. It was very disturbing. Other beekeepers began to notice similar sorts of very disturbing phenomena. You see, this is a, uh, a collapsing colony. The, the foragers are just missing. And what was particularly disturbing is that there were no bodies to be found. Um, bees 
die of all kinds of things in large numbers overnight, but often it's obvious what the problems are. Pesticide kills, for example, will leave big piles of dead bodies right by the hive. These were simply just not there. Um, now, disappearances have happened in the past, but up until the fall of 2006 and the spring of 2007, they have been quite limited in time and duration uh, and, and uh, geography. The series of disappearances in the 60s, mostly Louisiana and Texas, and just for a year or two. two. Um, the, but this, this particular wave of disappearances by June 2007 had uh, wiped out up to a third to a half of uh, the bees in North America, and over 35 states reported uh, these disturbing disappearances. Well, um, this attracted the attention not only of the scientific community but the general public. Um, I was part. I got. I got, came involved because I was part of a task force assembled in uh, Washington at the USDA uh, bee research facility to uh, prioritize hypotheses. Um, which involved dismissing a lot of uh, what had been offered, uh, including, but not limited to, <laughs> genetically modified corn pollen. Corn is wind pollinated, not bee pollinated. Cell phones, Wi-Fi, elevated CO2, elevated UVB, Osama bin Laden, automobile grills, solar maxima, jet chemical contrails, mutant bee cannibals, fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field, Chernobyl alien abduction, and bee rapture, where <laughs> all the bees went up to heaven. Uh, more plausible hypotheses, new diseases and parasites. Actually, um, beekeeping in, in the U.S. has been plagued uh, with wave after wave of all kinds of pests and problems. Pesticides, again, a long, sad history of association with, with honeybees. Ill health due to management, putting them on the back of flatbeds and driving them for uh, 2,000 miles at a clip. And possibly poor nutrition resulting from taking them to these monoculture crops where for days on end all they eat, all they can process is, corn, is clover pollen or almond pollen. Um, and actually one of the uh, catalysts for uh, concern is the almond industry, 660,000 acres in California, all of which need honeybees for a two-week period in February. Uh, no other way to get honeybees. And it's uh, half of America's bees, 1.2 million colonies, get transported to California just to pollinate those almonds. Well, clearly we had a mystery. So some, probably the most famous fictional entomologist of all time, barring ba Dr. Bambi Berenbaum, um, is Gil Grissom from the show CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. He's an in entomologist who, on, a, on October 11, 2007 episode, decides to investigate colony collapse disorder. Bees are dying in record numbers. Um, Sarah Seidel mentioned the canard that the human race will uh, die at, in four years after all the bees go. It was attributed to Einstein. He never said it. First appears in print actually about 30 years after he died. So if he said it, it was through a seance at a medium, uh, through a medium at a seance. But uh, so Grissom started to investigate using his forensic skills, and that's not a bad idea. The tools of forensic death investigation actually are pretty much applicable to the investigation of scientific mysteries as well. Um, and although there is a challenge in that they weren't developed for use with insects, and uh, Grissom was lucky in that he always has a body. Um, in, in the case of colony collapse disorder, the bodies were missing. Uh, but uh, the number, there are a number of suspects, and, and one of the uh, most... Uh, well, one of the early hypotheses to account for these disappearances was this incredible plague on honeybees. This is a, vir a varroa mite. Um, it is vir varroa destructor. It is actually not uh, normally associated with the e western honeybee. It's a, pa a parasite of the eastern honeybee. Western honeybees acquired this mite in North America. But it was accidentally introduced in the mid-'80s, and it... It is, this is a pupa, the, the metamorphic stage, which is helpless, sealed in a cell, and incapable of, of ridding itself. These are the mites. So it's, this is a parasite, not like when we get chiggers. This is a mite that's like the size of a dinner plate or like a lobster clinging to the body, sucking its blood and basically draining it of its vital vitality. They, so overnight, many colonies uh, simply crashed. And here you see the 
um, de sharp decline in the number of colonies nationwide over time, coinciding with the discovery of these varroa mites. But nobody saw any difference in colony collapse disorder um, hives in the frequency of varroa versus the one there. Everybody had varroa. Uh, new metagenomic uh, techniques that is facilitated by the full sequencing of the honeybee genome, all 10,157 genes in the honeybee genome, um, a project, by the way, that was based here at University of Illinois, coordinated by my colleague Gene Robinson, um, provided tools for a new kind of investigation, a metagenomic survey, which allowed investigators at Penn State, one of our alums, and uh, uh, Columbia to basically extract out from a honeybee all the nuclear material, all the genetic material that belongs to a bee, and then examine what's left. What's left doesn't belong in a bee. And what they found was a new pathogen, an Israeli acute paralysis virus, which was first described in Israel in 2004. And it was found in 83% of the CCD colonies. Problem is, the symptomatology didn't match. These bees don't disappear with the IAPV. They shiver and get paralyzed, hence the name. Moreover, Jay Evans at the USDA lab in Beltsville went into his freezer, pulled out bees from 2001, and with these new genetic tools, identified I IAPV. So it couldn't ex ac account for this sudden um, uh, and persisting uh, loss of bees. They also, through metagenomics, discovered a new species of fungus, a parasitic, a pathogenic fungus, Nosema serrani. Uh, Nosema, um, another species of Nosema has been along, around quite for some time. Nosema serrani um, has a different set of symptoms. 100% of the colonies surveyed had Nosema serrani. But then again, so did 81% of the healthy colonies. So that didn't seem like a, a solution. Pesticides, long suspect. Uh, not only agricultural pesticides, which uh, bees normally encounter as they forage across the landscape, uh, bees are basically flying dust mops, in the words of Jerry Vermenschenk, a um, bee biologist. They are built to attract small particles, like pollen grains. So as they go through the environment, they attract all kinds of things. Um, and we have new GC mass spec methods that can de detect very sm small quantities. Moreover, beekeepers are dumping miticides pesticides to kill the mites that are in the colonies. So talfluvalinate and apistan, which is apistan. And, and the biggest suspect was one, um, a class called the neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are a new class, like new nicotines. They're uh, neurotoxic pesticides that uh, are used extensively in the US. They're systemic, so you treat the seeds, and all parts of the plant contain these pesticides, including nectar and pollen. Uh, over 10 years ago in France, they were suspected of causing what was called mad bee disease in France and were banned. And in uh, laboratory experiments, it was clear that low exposures to metacloprid, even sublethal levels, caused learning and memory issues for honeybees, which could account for their failure to find their way home or to communicate or navigate. So these became an early suspects. But France still has problems after they banned the neonicotinoids. It, the, uh, imidacloprid, the principal, the, one of the earliest uh, neonics, has been used in the U.S. since 1996. I, as an aside, I mention here in central Illinois, every seed that goes in the ground, every corn seed, every soybean seed is pretreated with imidacloprid. And if, if imidacloprid were the reason for a CCD, we should be ground zero. And um, central Illinois never, has not yet had a case of CCD. So epidemiologically, it doesn't fit. Moreover, a survey done by Penn State um, agricultural chemists found uh, every conceivable kind of pesticide, but only very, very few samples with imidacloprid. In fact, the these, these same group uh, just a couple of, like a month ago, month ago, um, released a, a more thorough analysis of chemical contaminants and found over 120 different pesticides and pesticide metabolites in, in the hide, in the wax, in the pollen, and in the bees themselves. A staggering uh, load of pesticides, not just the inhive acaricides, the miticides, fluvalinate and cumafos, but almost everything else. And in this soup, yes, they found imidacloprid, but they also found fungicides, they found herbicides, they found... Uh, insecticides that have been banned for a long time, chlorpyrifos, Dursban. Um, so again, probably not neonics. You can't really pick them out of that soup, although that's certainly not good for uh, bees. What did we do here? Well, here at the University of Illinois, we had access to the honeybee genome and to a new tool for forensic inves investigation facilitated by the genome. 
Um, this is my student, G um, Reed Johnson, uh, who used this new tool to query the bee genome to find out what was going on and in the process perhaps to, to develop a diagnostic for recognizing colony collapse disorder because as it is, as it was at the time, it's simply a collection of symptoms. Without knowing the cause, it's very hard to identify. It's sort of basically self-identified. This is a whole honeybee whole genome microarray, a little glass slide with a little dot for every one of those 10,000 plus genes. And what a microarray does is it, it looks at which genes are turned on and which are turned off. So exposure to any particular kind of stress agent um, will uh, leave its footprint in the genome. Um, pesticides, for example, will upregulate, turn on those genes that detoxify pesticides. Um, uh, if it's a pathogen or a disease, uh, there's a whole suite of immune genes that are upregulated, turned on in the presence of the, the pathogen. Uh, and basically, this was really kind of tricky because to look at gene expression, we had to find certifiably healthy bees. And since no one knew what CCD was, how do you know what you have is healthy or in the early stages of collapsing? So we went back to the freezer along with Jay Evans bees and before there was CCD, you used their healthy bees for comparison. We used Central Illinois bees, which have never had CCD reported. Did all kinds of comparison to winnow those 10,000 bees down, genes down to a few diagnostic genes. And we ultimately came up with a set of about 60. This is called a heat map, and it shows which genes are turned on in which populations, historical Pennsylvania, Florida, California, and the like. Um, on is uh, yellow, hot and bright. Cold is turned off or downregulated. And we didn't see the footprint for toxicology for exposure to pesticides. We didn't see a footprint for exposure to disease, although we did see some of the antibacterial proteins that were downregulated in CCD. What we did see was a big cluster of uh, genetic material that wasn't even supposed to be on the microarray. They were fragments of ribosomes. What's a ribosome? Ribosome is the protein factory of the cell, the protein manufacturing center of the cell. What would cause ribosomes in honeybees afflicted with CCD to break up? Turns out that honeybees uh, are afflicted not only with fungi and uh, um, but with a, a tremendous diversity of viruses. That IAPV is a new virus. There are many other viruses. They're all in a group called the picorna-like viruses. Pico means little RNA, picorna-like, little, little RNA viruses that all attack the ribosome. The way a virus works, it gets into the cell, gets into the protein factory, hijacks the factory, and converts it to making viral proteins, not honeybee proteins. So it's sort of depicted here, attached to the ribosome, diverting all its activity to, to um, uh, virus proteins. And what we were seeing were the dregs of broken ribosomes, which implicated viruses. And it turns out CCDBs may not have a heavier viral load, but they are attacked by more different viruses, all of which attack the ribosome. So it was sort of a, a scenario of a straw that breaks the camel's back. That IAPV itself wasn't CCD diagnostic, but it may have been the third, fourth, or fifth virus that bee populations were inf inf uh, infected with. Multiple virus infections are becoming increasingly common, not just here in the US, all over the world. Um, here's a paper from Denmark. Multiple infections. There are th four or five or six different viruses af afflicting certain bees. Uh, and why? Is the virus number going up? Globalization of trade. And in fact, 2005, the almond growers were so desperate for bees that they convinced Congress in, uh, to overturn the 1922 Honeybee Act, which prohibits importation of live bees in order to bring in bees from Australia uh, and to use in 2006, which is when colony collapse disorder first appeared. And those bees from Australia, which were ostensibly healthy and have not yet collapsed, nonetheless carried IAPV. So that uh, another, as this particular paper shows what happens when Hungary joined the European Union for long times in isolation, beekeepers in Hungary had a different suite of viruses than the, than the beekeepers in the rest of Europe. When the bees intermingle, so do the viruses and the viral uh, load goes up. And um, this may be what's happening all over the world. This is a paper that just came out two months ago reporting not only losses this past year of 30% in the US, 
but also up to 85% 80, uh, in the Middle East, 50% in Europe, and 25% in Japan. So globally, uh, the honeybees may be in big trouble. Now, this analysis doesn't directly prove incontrovertibly that viral load is... Uh, uh, what's behind CCD. In fact, once the ribosomes go, you can't make any proteins. That means you're vulnerable to poor nutrition, you're vulnerable to pesticides, and everything else that seems to cause it. But that those ribosome fragments can be a diagnostic for identifying colony collapse disorder and allow beekeepers to recognize the early stages and perhaps provide supplementary protein fun functions, uh, protein supplements. So in short, the real-life mysteries aren't always neatly solved in the course of a single episode. There's still ongoing research. There's not a general consensus about what CCD is, where it is, and, and what to do about it. Um, but at least we have a diagnostic. And people have asked me in the theme of life and death here, um, are we going to lose all our honeybees? Well, unlikely. First of all, there are about seven species in the genus Apis, so it's not, the western honeybee is not only one of several. Moreover, there are about uh, 20 races of honeybees, and American apiculture uses 90% of the bees in American apiculture are one race, the Italian bee from uh, the Mediterranean region. There's many, many other races, which, uh, some of which, including the notorious uh, Apis mellifera cutilata, the African bee that was uh, the killer bee, seems to be a bit resistant to CCD, <laughs> and that's kind of in the southern tier of our states. So they're not probably going to go extinct, but the beekeepers might go extinct. They cannot withstand uh, repeated losses of, of one-third of their stocks year after year. Imagine if these were losses of chicken farmers or other livestock, you know, sort of more traditional livestock. Um, it's simply not tenable. And without beekeepers, we don't have pollination services. So um, prospects for survival of pollinator, wild pollinators are really impossible to assess. We've paid very little attention to them. Uh, but if there's a lesson here, so we should not take bees for granted or pollinators for granted. Sunshine may be an unlimited resource for growing uh, fruits, nuts, and vegetables, but uh, pollination is not. And I think I hope, uh, hopeful, on an optimistic note, say thank you to the organizers, thank you to all kinds of people who helped with this work. Thank you.